Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. We're going to uh, just finish Dwight's study, and we're going to go into a new study. Um, and this is going to be the continuation of the symbolic use of numbers. So I just need to open the document here. Stay on a second. So um, what I've been doing is going through the... Um, basically in a chronological order. And let's switch this around. There we go. Going through in a, a chronological order. This isn't working. Hang on. There we go. Um, how we came to understand symbolic use of numbers. So it wasn't something that we, you know, when it that we did retroactively that is we did not you know come up with july 18th and then go back and create all of these different ideas these ideas developed by studying biblical prophecy so in uh, 2014 i had put together uh, these studies and um and so that's what we're going to be doing looking at these these studies uh basically chronologically so the one we're going to look at today is what I studied in 2015. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the Sabbath and for the fellowship that we can have and for the things that you have been teaching us, uh, those lessons that um, reveal to us our need of you and also reveal your love and mercy and grace towards us uh, that we can be effective in ministering to those around us and that we can be drawn into your presence. And so we invite your spirit now to be here to guide and direct uh, our minds, those that watch this video later. And we pray for a blessing upon all and that you can care for us and that we can know that you love us. Be with us now through thy spirit, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to bring up my notes here. So right now I don't have anything on the screen, sharing the screen. Um, so what ended up happening in 2000 and uh, 15. So in 2014, I had gone uh, to the School of the Prophets. And then the next year, in 2015, in Alberta, we had a camp meeting at Wabaman. And um, Tabo at that time was not very happy with me. I'm not particularly certain why. Um, but he, he didn't even, I don't think he even wanted to give me any speaking spots. Um, but he ended up doing that and he put them at, at kind of grouped them all together right at the beginning. Um, if I remember correctly, I, I mean, I probably have to look, look at it. Um, anyway, I ended, I ended up with, uh, I think three speaking spots and, and Jeff came in the midweek and he heard uh, one of them, uh, the last one, of course. And um, so what I did is I did a study on the three woes. So I dealt with uh, uh, the trumpets themselves just briefly and then addressed each of the woes. I'm trying to find my notes here. This is not working anymore. Can't search for anything. Um, so let me see if I can find it this way. I should have opened up this one, but um, I haven't. do it this way. Sorry about that. So um, now at the time, I mean, I wasn't really that interested in, in studying the seven trumpets, but I had run across a book because I was studying of the daily. I ran across a book by a guy named Heidi Hikes and Heidi Hikes had written a book called Satan, uh, Satan's Counterfeit Prophecy. And this was uh, a study on 
Josiah Litch's prophecy, where he said that basically this prophecy had failed. And um, so it was, and I thought I even sent this to somebody recently, but Uh, I'm going to search this way. Okay, there they are. Okay, there's my PowerPoint. That's the other way to do it. Okay, so so I started reading this book by Heidi Hikes and started recognizing all kinds of problems with what he was saying. Now, at the time, so in 2015, I mean, we had already started understanding a little bit about the biblical calendar, right? So we had uh, looked at um, Ezra 7, 9, and, you know, and I probably could have addressed that as well, but, you know, we're going to address that in other places because um, it's going to be later that I actually really start to understand and, and, and see how that connects, especially in connection with Samuel Snow's letters. So um, these are my notes here, the seven trumpets and the three woes. So these are the original notes I had, I believe. And um, so I'm, I'm going to address uh, these pro uh, problems that Heidi Hikes has. So I have this uh, introduction, which I'm not going to go through, um, just to say that uh, an example of this attack can be found in the book by Heidi Hex called Satan's Counterfeit Prophecy. The book contains a systematic attack upon his foundational prophecy, this foundational prophecy, and Sister White's endorsement of it. Various authors attack the trumpets in a variety of ways, some even while trying to endorse traditional views, while many look for future fulfillments of the trumpets. So you know, one of the things I do is I address you know, the trumpets themselves, uh, the trumpets and the plagues and the different views that people have in trying to compare the trumpets and the plagues. So sometimes you'll have people just say the trumpets are future, but they're just a description of the plagues. And of course, that's not true. Uh, there are similarities, but there's also differences. Right. Um, one is we can see that there's some aspects that are literal in the trumpets that in the plagues are symbolic. Um, and uh, they, they use a quote about Ellen White, trumpet after trumpet will sound, vial after vial will be poured out. And I address that. Um, but that's not re the real interest right now. Um, I go through what happens in the, uh, the, the trumpets there. And then I'm going to deal with the fifth and sixth trumpets and the first and second woe. So this one becomes the one that, that really is of interest to us here in the present time because of the symbolic use of numbers. So we have a time prophecy and um, we're gonna look at it in detail. Some of the problems with uh, what Josiah Litch had to address in, in making this prediction. Because uh, a lot of these things, his, his basic struggle on how he made his decisions about it aren't really shared. We know that originally He's going to say um, that it's going to be in the month of, of August in 1840, right? And then he's going to nail it down later on, uh, just before uh, it's fulfilled. Uh, he's going to nail down a date. But originally, he doesn't do that. He just says, you know, sometime in the month of August in 1840. So that means in, in him making this calculation, he already has some idea about it, but he's not completely certain when he first makes this prediction. And he's going to make that prediction in, in 1838 and then later in 1840. Right. Um, so I, I'm sure that most of us are familiar with this prophecy. Now, one of the things uh, that we address or that I addressed was this five months period. And so... Uh, this chart here, this uh, chart has, um, let me just hang a second here. Is that working? Okay. So this chart has um, 
two different periods of 150 years, as you will notice. So, so one of the things that I noticed is that, and, and here I have AD 629 for the fifth trumpet beginning to sound. That was based on Uriah Smith. Uh, different dates are given, 606. Um, is usually a pretty common date. Um, I think now, um, yeah, in, 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 I, I changed it later in my charts, but, but this is what I had at that time. So it's just my first time really deep diving into the chronology of Josiah Lich's understanding. Now, uh, the reason why I have this period of 150 years, so that's going to be uh, 632 AD. That's going to be the year that uh, the Islamic calendar begins. Or pardon me, it's not, it's, it's the year that, um, pardon me, Abu Bakr's decree happens. It's 10 years after the Islamic calendar begins because it begins in 622. And 10 years later, uh, Muhammad is going to die and Abu Bakr uh, becomes the first caliph or successor of Muhammad. And he's going to, uh, so we're going to look at that. Um, he's going to, um, I'm going to switch all of this up here. He's going to give this, uh, what they call his command, Abu Bakr's uh, command. And that's in verse four. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. So these are these locusts. So I probably should go back just for somebody who's not familiar with this. In Revelation chapter nine, we're going to have the fifth angel sound and we see a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given a key of the bottomless pit. So this is going to refer to uh, Muhammad. And he opened the bottomless pit and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air are darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth and unto them was given power. And as the scorpions of the earth have power. So I'm not gonna go to an in-depth study of this here, I'm just going to say that this is our understanding that these locusts represent Islam, and they are on the chart, right? That is, um, we have the description of these, uh, uh, right? Um, what they, they're horses, right? Representing the first and second woe. And that is, there's going to be descriptions here that are going to uh, say, like in verse uh, seven, and the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as were crowns of gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. So I have seen people try to describe these as being helicopters. Um, and now when we say that they're locusts, but they're like unto horses prepared unto battle, I mean, we know that this is symbolic language, yet there is characteristics here that would connect to a visual image of Islam as they conquered, right? As they uh, came, their armies came, right? So obviously locusts, we can see that those are going to represent Islam and I'm not gonna go through the whole study on these things. Um, what becomes of interest is when we get into um, these, these periods of five months. So you're going to see in, in verse 10 and verse five, that five months is going to be mentioned. And we know five months, that's 150 years. So you see it here. Their torment was the tor torment of a scorpion, uh, which striketh a man and they should be tormented five months. Right. And in, in verse 10, and they had tails like unto scorpions and there were stings in their tails and their power was to hurt men five months. And what we often do is we just say, well, that's the same period of five months. But my suggestion was that these are actually two different periods. So we have the fifth trumpet sound. We have Abu Bekr's command, which is going to begin a period of five months. And these end with the Treaty of Constantinople in 782. And then there's 517 years 
uh, to the beginning of the 150 years, which we call the first woe. And it was interesting. So notice here, um, I have 126 years and 391 years. Now, of course, 391 comes from the prophecy of the 391, right? So that's going to be uh, later on. So you can see that I can take that 517 years and I can have 126 and 391. So why is this significant that I noticed this in 2015? What does this remind us of? What happened uh, in child What's that? Yes, and uh, with uh, Daniel Pereira, I think he uh, done some calculations. It was like 126 days. Okay. From the 27th of July until the 9th of November. Uh, until October 13th. So, so, so what, yeah, so you have the right idea. So what happens is on October 13th, 10 days after Tess had presented, so this is in 2018, 10 days after Tess had presented uh, two presentations, one called 10 years and the other one called the Midnight Cry. Um, we had uh, on that date, it was October 3rd. Daniel's actually going to mention during that uh, prayer meeting that evening that he had had uh, noted that the midnight cry was going to be given on October 13th. And he believed that it would be on that date that, that, that this date would be given that we were going to predict, right? So, so he shares this on the evening of October 3rd. Now, 10 days later, he's going to be the one doing the sermon at Lambert Church. Now, this 126 days he did as an inclusive count, starting from uh, June 10th, uh, 2018, when Parminder first presents um, time setting. And he notes this on July 27th. So we know July 27th is this important date in the prophecy of Josiah Litch, right? Because that's when it's going to start the 150 years. So one thing we see here is we see this 126 years, which represents this 126 days that Daniel spoke of. So he says from June 10th, we're going to count the 126 days to October 13th, right? And I'm not going to go into all the details of, of why he made that prediction, but, but this is what he had said. And he, he noted it on July 27th. He took a screenshot of his phone uh, with his message of what he thought was going to happen. Now, on October 13th, he's, he's presenting this message and talking about this, the 126 days. And we know that we're talking about November 9th, 2019. Now, what I do is I wanted to know well, I'm sitting there in Lambert Church. How many days is it to uh, November 9th, 2019? So I didn't have all the resources now. I couldn't just put it into the calendar of converter. I didn't have that program. So I had to figure it out. And, and I found that if I started from noon, it would bring me to midnight commencing November 9th, um, 2019. If it was 391 Point five days. Now the 391.5 is something that I'm not going to present until uh, the next year, 2016. So, so I had kind of presented it a little bit in 2014. That is, I understood that the period of the kings of Judah was 391 and a half years. Um, but you can see why this was so compelling to me. Because I knew these things, when, when Daniel starts speaking of this, I'm right away going to see this pattern, okay? I see the July 27th date, and, and I know things about this July 27th date in 2015 that come into play in 2018. But at the time, these were not really important details. The only thing that I saw here 
was, well, we have a symbol of 126 years and 391 years, and, and they're part of 517 years. And that's, that's interesting, right? Um, that I have this 126 and 391. And, and that comes from understanding the two periods of 150 years. And this is something that Jeff notes and, and he comes to accept at, at that camp meeting. He accepts that it's, it's something that we notice that, you know, now usually people had taken either the 150 years, you'll see this with um, uh, the guy who wrote the, the third, uh, the third caliphate. Um, he's going to take this 150 years as the 150 years as of the first world. Uh, but I really believe that the 150 years of the first world is the second period of 150 years, because that's going to be the rise of Othman, right? So the Ottoman Empire, and, and that has to be the case. And that, of course, that's the understanding on the charts as well. So, so we have July 27th, 1299, and, and that's going to end in 1449, right? So, so we have here some symbols, symbols that... At the time, you know, I understand 126 years represents the 126 shekels, right? Um, which is, you know, gives you 25, 20 giras. And one year and 26 days is 391 days, as Iran notes here, right? That is one year and 25 days is the three, 390. And we, we get this also, this also connects us to the prophecy of Ezekiel, which which I'm going to present in more detail in 2016, which is what we're going to look at at next in the next study. But here we have these these symbols. So there's 126 years, one year and 26 days is 391 days, right? So the fact that we have these symbols together is also important. Um, now I'm not going to go through this whole study, but I, I go through. Uh, under trying to understand uh, this. So this is going to be the first and second woe together. So we get the 391 years and 15 days. Uh, that's going to be Revelation 9, verse 15. And so uh, it's the hurting of Rome and the slaying of Rome. So the first and second woe. And one of the things I note is that the seventh trumpet doesn't begin to sound till October 22nd, 1844. Now, originally, they believe that the sixth trumpet ceased sounding on August 11th, 1840. But one of the things that, that Ellen White comes to understand and others is that the sixth trumpet continues to sound until October 22nd, 1844. So here at this time, I'm just trying to establish the timing of the trumpets and these periods of time, but I want to be more precise. And so what I note here is now I'm saying the Jewish Karaite calendar, um, because back then I didn't really understand that the Karaite calendar uh, was misunderstood. Um, um, but what we see happening here, and, and we're gonna look at the calendar converter and look at this more detail, but I looked at 1299 and 1840, and I put the biblical dates um, with the Julian dates. And, and so what we have is the month of, that's the fifth month, and the month August, right? So they, uh, the month August is on the bottom. So you see Tammuz is the fourth month. And then we have uh, July, right, underneath it, 1299. And then you're going to see the 26th day of Tammuz is the 27th day of July in 1299. Now that's on the Julian calendar. And, and then you could see that we could count from that. Now, obviously in 1299, we're not gonna count the 15 days. And, um, but that's one thing that uh, Josiah Litch could have done. What he could have done is he could have counted the days first, cause that's the hour. And, uh, and then, so you could have counted the hour, which would give you the days, right? So an hour is, um, is well, if you take a prophetic month, right? You take a prophetic year, prophetic year is 12 months. And so you'd have to divide it into 24 hours, right? Uh, prophetic year. 
And then you would take, uh, because that would be uh, a half of a half of a month, so 15 days, right? So if you divide it into 12, that would be 30, 30 days to um, the hour, or, or 30 days to the to the to 12, right? But we're dividing it into 24. I don't know. I didn't explain it very well. Does that make sense to people? That if you're going to take a day and divide it into hours, um, that you're going to divide that an hour into 15 days. So that's why it's going to be 15 days. So he could have counted 15 days and then he could have counted um, um, because it goes an hour, a day, a month, and a year. So a day would be a year, right? So then he could have counted 360 years. And, and he could have worked it out that way, but he didn't. And, and I don't know if I have time to show why, but, but that's not how he did it, right? He did it by counting first 360 years, then 30 years, then one year, and then 15 days. So when we look at the where he counts the days, it's going to be at the bottom, right? It's going to be in 1840. Now, when he ends the 391 years, he's going to end on July 27th because he begins on July 27th, 1299. And so he's just going to end on July 27th, 1840. And then he's going to count the 15 days, right? And the 15 days is going to give him August 11th, right? Now, for some reason I'm counting, I put that bracket from the end of the day, I'm not really sure why. Now, one of the things you see though, is that in 1840 and in 1299, the 26th day of the fourth month, the 26th of Tammuz, is the 27th of July. One is the Julian and one is the Gregorian. So, he had a number of options. So we're going to go here, just hang on. This computer's not working right. Okay, so what we're going to do is I'm going to share this. <clears throat> okay, so this is the calendar converter, and we're going to put these dates in here. So we're going to do the Julian date in 1299, and that's going to be July 27th. And you're going to see here it's going to be the 26th day of Tammuz. Right? And you're gonna see that the Julian date is July 27th. But we have, a, we have a Gregorian date as well, August 3rd. Now, why didn't uh, Josiah Litch count from August 3rd? Because he could have said, well, um, I, have a, I have a Gregorian date because we're in the Gregorian calendar. And, and he would know about that. Right, he would know because it's not been that long that we've had uh, the Julian calendar in the United States. It's only been since 1752, so at that time it's going to be you know less than 100 years. And he would know, you know, that presidents and and, and grandparents and stuff that they were born on Julian dates, and and that they in a sense would have two birthdays. They could celebrate their Julian birthday or their Gregorian birthday. So he would know this, but. He's going to choose to use the Julian date and he's not going to adjust for the Gregorian date in 1840. Why not? Why doesn't he, he adjust it? Why doesn't he say, well, I need to adjust it? Well, part of the problem would be when is he going to adjust it? Because he could have started here in 1299, right? And he could have said, well, in 1299, July 27th, Julian was August 3rd, uh, Gregorian. And so he could have counted the 15 days from August 3rd. Now, if he had done so, would he have arrived at the correct date? 
he would have ended up on August 18th, right? Now, we know also that he counted uh, the 541 years together. That is, he didn't just um, count to um, the 150 years and then start from there and count 391 and a half. He actually included them as an entire period of 541 years right? to, to get his date. So he's going to start on July 27th, 1299 because he has an event. That's the beginning of the Ottoman Empire, okay? Um, and then he's gonna count 150 years. So he's gonna go to uh, um, 1449. Now, notice that if you go to July 27th in 1449, on the Julian calendar, you actually, um, it, the Gregorian is moved over by two days, right? Now, he just says that it goes to July 27th, 1449, but there is no event, right? No event that he's marking there. He's just marking at the end of the 150 years. And then he's going to count again another 150 years uh, to 1840. But you can see here that he now, if he had done that and kept the Julian date, he would have had to count from August 8th. 15 days, and he would have ended up with August 23rd. Is this making sense to people, the problems that he would face if he was to consistently use the Julian calendar or if he was to consistently use the Gregorian calendar? Right? So he had he could have counted from August 3rd. He could have counted from August 5th. He could have counted from August 8th if he had used the Gregorian calendar. And if he had chose to, you know, use an event uh, in 1449, just say, well, I'm going to count from that uh, uh, Gregorian date. So, so he had these different problems. Now, so the fact that I noticed that there was this 26th day of the fourth month back in 2015 led me to look at this in a little more detail. And one of the things I noticed, so if we go back to 1299, that if I go to, so I have July 27th, but I have this date here, the 26th day of the fourth month. And the 26th day of the fourth month, if I count, um, so I'm gonna add 541 years, so that would be 800 and, um, 85, right? And that's going to be bring me to July 27th, 1840 on the Gregorian calendar, right? So the question is, well, if the 26th day of the fourth month is actually how he was counting it without knowing it, we could see that God's hand was in, uh, in his calculation because at the time, Josiah Litch doesn't know anything about the biblical calendar when he makes this calculation in 1838 and 1840, right? And I think part of the reason why he had trouble pinpointing it and into which day in August that the Ottoman Empire was going to fall probably had to do with this problem of the Julian and the Gregorian. So originally in 1838, he doesn't give a specific date because I think he's uncertain about how to calculate it. But he decides, in God's providence, to just do nothing about it, to use the Julian date and the Gregorian date just as a symbol. Does, does that make sense, that he's using it as a symbol? He's not trying to figure out the Julian or the Gregorian calendars, because he has so many different options. Does that make sense to people, that this... But this, in a sense, he's using it as a symbol. July 27th becomes a symbol to calculate this, this prophetic number of days. But if he had known the biblical calendar, he would have come to the same date. Okay. Now, um, when we go to 1449, so I'm just going to take off 
391 here, so I don't know. Anyway, I'll do it this way, it's easier. Right, and I'm going to go to, whoops. Um, 1449, one thing that you will see is that uh, the Gregorian date in 1449 for the 26th of Tammuz is also July 27th. Now, originally when I did this in 2015, I didn't have the, cal the, the calendar converted. And what I noticed is that the 26th of Tammuz in 1449 on the Julian calendar, because that's all I had, was July 18th. So I stored that information in the back of my mind, right? That the July 18th and July 27th are the same date in 1449. Now that, that wasn't significant in 2015 to understand that. And, and, and I didn't understand it in 2015 uh, completely, right? I, I just knew that there was a July 18th date. I didn't know. Um, I think I did the calculation, tried to figure it out. And then it's like, and I don't remember specifically when I did it. I don't know if I did that in 2015 or later that I noticed this. I knew it though before 2018. So it wasn't just in 2018 that I knew that these dates had lined up. Um, now, we also found out later uh, that if we counted uh, from 1449, if you're going to count um, to July 27th, uh, that we could take this 26th day of the fourth. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to add 360. So that's going to be um, 360. So it would be 800 and um, 56. Now, um, no, that's wrong. Uh, I gotta go, oh yeah, 54. Okay, so 1809. Now, one of the things is in 1809, if you look at the 26th of Tammuz, now notice it's July 28th, not July 27th. Okay, and that's just because uh, uh, where the in the period in the time of the Millerites, they're they're not going to. Um, so this is just based on this cal calculator, the calendar converted. But they actually are calculating the biblical calendar a little bit differently. And if we counted this from Boston, this would actually be July twenty seventh, the twenty sixth of Tammuz. So it's it's just a, a little side note there. But the calendar converter doesn't uh, show that. And that's going to be, so that's 360 years. And then we go to 1839. So we have to add uh, another, whoops, another uh, 30 years. So that's going to be an hour day, a month is going to be 30 years. And you'll see July 27th, Julian is the 26th of Thomas. So again, you have a Julian date and it's August 8th on the Gregorian. And then of course we go the one year later, right? So that's where it's gonna line up with the Gregorian is gonna be July 27th. And we also noted that in the Gregorian um, calendar, July 27th is gonna be uh, the Treaty of Dardanelles in 1809. And then in 1839, you're gonna have uh, the collective note um, or whatever it's, uh, is it the collective note? And then you're going to have um, all of these things happening with the year, the month, the day, and then the hour are all going to be fulfillments of prophecy in this reverse order. That is, that is when he does the calculation, he does it, doesn't do it, hour, day, month, and year. He goes year, month, day, hour to arrive at his conclusion, right? Because he's going to go from here and add the 15 days, right, to get August 11th. Okay, does that make sense to people? So these symbols were then understood, at least in part, in 2015. So 
when we we think about this um where's this so when we think about this why why does god do that i mean we end up with this prediction about july 18th so we know july 18th uh 1449 is um the 20 the 26th of Tammuz. You know, so we, we, we're actually counting from a July 18th to get the 391 years and 15 days to August 11th. Does that make sense? Now, there's a lot more to these 391 years and 15 days um, uh, that I'm going to come to understand as time goes on. Um, see if I can find this here. I just opened up another program. Okay. Now, this 26th day of the fourth month we use again and again, right? We're using this uh, symbol over and over, 26th day of the fourth month. And not everybody really knows where it comes from. And I'm trying to find some specific chart here before I switch over. Okay. There's what I want, at least one of them. So this just shows uh, what we were looking at. So, so in 2018, uh, Stephen and I are exchanging some emails regarding this, um, this 26th day of the fourth month. And after I had figured out uh, July 18, Julian, uh, Stephen tries to do some calculations. And, and what he does here, so um, is he takes this six months, 180 years. So I remember he made a mistake, so it wasn't correct uh, how he got to July 18, 2020 Gregorian. Um, I think he started from August 11th and he did something, but I don't think he understood the 26th day of the fourth month. And so I pointed that out to him. Um, but anyway, what we have here is you can see the first whoa, July 27th, uh, 1299. That's the 26th day of the fourth month. It's a Julian date of July 27th. You have the first woe of 150 years. Then you have July 27th, 1449, the Gregorian date, 26th day of the fourth month um, on the biblical calendar. And it's July 18th, Julian. So we have that July 18th in there. And then we have the second woe, 391 years. Um, but I'm not going to put the 15 days in there. Just instead of the 15 days, which is a half of a month, we're going to take a half of a year because that's gonna come from the prophecy of Ezekiel uh, and from the chronology of the kings of Judah. So Stephen suggested that we take a half of a prophetic year instead of a half of a month. And that's gonna bring us to 2020, right? Is that how you remember it, Stephen, back in 2018? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can't remember how you, how you did it. I know that you did it wrong. You made a mistake, but it, it ended up correct. And then, then I looked at it and I said, well, we have the 26th day of the fourth month. Let's look at that. So what we found is that this 26th day of the fourth month lined up with July 18th. So we already had July 18th on the Julian calendar, which is July 31st, 2020. But with this, and you can see we took that symbol that we got from Daniel from Brazil um, of when he had figured out that 126 years. And, and so with that symbol, that led us to look at this prophecy in the first place, right? Plus the similarity between the 391 and 15 days and the 391 and a half. So this, this led to this understanding, July 18, 2020.
as a Gregorian date. Now, now all these different symbols coming into play in these prophecies in the past, if we looked at, at what unfolded, is this not how God works? That uh, as we pass over the ground of fulfilled prophecy, light shines on to back into the past, on, on prophecies in the past, and that understanding then gives light for the future. So when we made these, when we did these studies and we, we, we had no idea that we were going to predict an event, right? When we're, when we're studying these, these prophecies of the past, no indication of that. But it seems pretty evident that these symbols came to play in our movement. Now, the understanding at the time, the problem that I was having is I don't believe in time setting, but I see that all of these symbols are witnessing to what um, Tess had presented, the November 9th, 2019 date, and that it was impossible for me to dismiss that. That is, I already knew these symbols. I wasn't, you know, finding them to fit into what she was saying. I already knew them. And so the 126 days and the 391 days um, would fit with the 20, 126 years and the 391 years, the July 27th date. I already knew the 26th day of the fourth month. And we had in the one below, which is a little tinier, uh, but this was Ezekiel's prophecy. And this is where I first came up with, um, you know, using <coughs> Ezekiel, the 10th day of the fifth month symbol, right? So that's what I first present. Because I'm I'm focused on the 391 and a half years of the kings of Judah. So I'm going to use this prophecy of Ezekiel that I had presented in 2016, which we're going to look at in more detail next time. Um, and that also gave me July 18th. So, so this is what was happening. This was not. So the question that the person would have to ask, were these symbols given by God to understand our situation at the time? Or were they something that was given by Satan? And if you believe, of course, uh, people like Heidi Hikes, who wrote the book, you know, Satan's Counterfeit Prophecy, dealing with Josiah Litch's understanding, um, he's attributing to Satan something that can only be attributed to God. Because does Satan have control of all of this? Does he have control of the biblical calendar? Does he have control of the sky? Right? And we come to understand so much more about this 391 year period, that it's, it's a natural lunar cycle, and that it's based upon um, a, a solar lunar cycle. Right? So that is um, 391 years. And, and you see that there. Notice how the Gregorian date lines up with the biblical date 391 years apart. Right, so July 27th, 1449 is a Gregorian date. And the biblical date is the 26th day of the fourth month. And then July 27th, 1840 is also a Gregorian date. So those are based on the solar calendar. But you can see that the biblical date lines up. And it would only do that uh, one e once in every 30. Uh, if, if you took random periods of, of spans of time, uh, only one out of 30 times would they line up like this, right, on average. So, and, and there's more to it as well. Um, so maybe, it, you know, one of the things I guess I can, because I've talked about it a lot, is um, this, which of course deals with the Mayan calendar. But this period of 391 years, as I looked at it in more detail, one is I noticed it was 12 periods of 11,900 days. Actually, 12 periods of 11,900 days and 1,190 minutes each. And that is, that's how long 
you would have each one of these is 391 months. So obviously 391 years can be divided into 12 periods of 391 months, right? But, but that period of 391 months is the number of months on our calendar where the Islamic calendar would have 403 months. And that is they're using a lunar month and we're using a Gregorian month. And that's 32 years and seven months on our calendar and 33 years and seven months on theirs. And that's, that's when Ramadan comes around again uh, to meet up with our calendar. Right. Now, another interesting thing is that uh, if we take 144,000 days, um, this period of 391 years is 1,190 days less. So this 1,190 or 1,190, 900, uh, shows up in different ways within this structure. And that's extremely unlikely to not be designed, right? So, so a person could argue, well, Satan, Satan has done all this to deceive us. And that's really the conclusion that, that many people in this movement have now come to, is that this is all a deception of Satan. Um, but they're basically attributing to Satan what is the power of God. And what is that? If, if we attribute to the power of God uh, to the power of Satan, it, it would be a type of blasphemy, right? Right. So, and I'm not trying to be harsh on anyone. I'm just saying God is the one in control. He oversees all. Is Satan the wonderful number? No. Yes. Oh, he can't be. Christ is the wonderful it's number. A, it's He's a the one time. who controls it's all. A time. What's that? It's a time and a place. It's a time and a place and ground to tread carefully, uh, sacredly, sacred ground. Yeah. You call it blasphemy. It's uh, really putting your head on the line. <laughs> no, but I'm just saying, if you attribute something to to Satan, that is actually God's under God's purview, right? The sun and the moon and the stars, these are given as signs for seasons and days and years. All of our time prophecy, the 2300 days, the 70 weeks, all of these are from Christ. Is this prophecy of Josiah Litch from Revelation 9 of Christ? Absolutely. For sure. Yeah, it comes from Christ. And and if it comes from Christ, all of these witnesses to it coming from Christ, this idea that 391 years is this solar lunar cycle, one of the most accurate solar lunar cycles in such a small, it's only um, like a few minutes off. I can't remember what, how many minutes it is off from the solar cycle lining up with the lunar cycle. And, and so you can use this. The, the lunar cycle is going to continue to repeat every 391 years. If you know the lunar cycle for this period of time, it's going to repeat with only a few minutes difference. And, that, and, that's, and this is built into this prophecy in Revelation 9. This is the month and the day and the year. A month and a day and a year in prophetic time is exactly 142,810 days. which is, you know, can be divided into periods of 11,900 days and 1,190 minutes. And that 142,810 days um, is 1,190 days less than 144,000 days. So this would be the, the fingerprint of God. This would be the fingerprints of Palmoni, right? It could not have been conceived by Satan. It could not be controlled by Satan. And it could not have come from Satan because it is affirming God's prophecy. It's evidence that these prophecies in the past were of God. 
And if we were to remove that evidence, um, we have very little left to stand on, especially when it comes to any time prophecy, because they're based upon Palmoni. And, and people can just criticize them and say, well, you know, the, the, the Seventh-day Adventists in picking the 2300 days, they were setting the time for the second coming of Christ. They were wrong. He didn't come. And they later on, you know, made up this story about Jesus being, uh, you know, the high priest in the most holy place uh, doing the Day of Atonement. And the problem was they started trying to predict the second coming of Christ. And all these dates and numbers are all just a deception. That's exactly what's happening in the movement now in regard to our July 18, 2020 prediction. And if you make that attack against July 18, 2020, you're making that attack against the 2300 days and the 70 weeks. And so you, you could go right back to the beginning of Christianity and say, that's all just a deception. It's a deception of Satan, right? And, and so you would just have to be a Jew and have to reject Christ based on, because the same types of arguments, the disappointment of the disciples parallels the disappointment of the Millerites. And if you, if you attack the disappointment of the Millerites, you're attacking the disappointment of the disciples. And if you're attacking July 18, 2020, our disappointment, you're attacking the disappointment of the Millerites and the disappointment of the disciples. Right? I don't see any other way around it. We, we have a choice. The choice is, was God leading this movement? Was God leading the Seventh-day Adventist church? Was God le leading the Christian church? Or has Satan deceived us? And, and for us as individuals, we have to say, if God is leading us, what is he showing us about our lives? And if God wasn't leading us, what does that say about us? I find it hard to accept that somebody says, God was not leading me, but I want you to continue to follow me. Does that make sense? No. No. You know, if we were under a deception, I would see no reason why we would continue following this movement. Because if we were deceived, especially if we were deceived, like since 2012 or 2013, whenever the, you know, we're going to look Ezra 7, 9, is that the beginning of the deception of the symbolic use of numbers where we started to look at that, which we're going to study. Um, you know, if that was the deception and we had been following that, well, how could we even, how would we expect anybody to trust us now? How could we have been off course for so long? And then our repentance now means that we're going to, to go back to what was true. But how do we know that what we were teaching before that deception was even true? If we were deceived then, what point were we deceived? Right? Either God was leading this movement or he was not. Amen. Yeah. And, and for me personally, when I look at what God has done, that is within this movement, within my life personally, um, what he has taught us from his word, all of the different confirmations of the truths that we have inherited that are being confirmed by these studies, um, tells me that it's of God and that I have to accept it, even though there is a cross to bear. And there definitely is a cross to bear. What's that look like, cross to bear? Where, or with who, or with what? Well, one is we have to, we have to stand under criticism, we lose all of our friends. Uh, we end up alone. We end up in a movement that, um, you know, is being ridiculed. 
So there's a lot of pressure. Chat. Mm-hmm. Chat. Chat. I'm just checking them off as you're listing them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and there is, of course, you know, what we've had to face about ourselves. Big check mark on that one. Because we've had to face uh, a lot of things about ourselves. And um, so I, 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 all I see is God's hand. I don't see any of Satan's hand. I see that, you know, God's will goes contrary to my will. God's word goes contrary to my will, right? And that God puts me in places that I don't want to be. God humbles us. And we were proud. We believed that, you know, we were going to be vindicated. All our friends would know that we made this prediction and that we, they would just, you know, want to hear us, right? But that's not what happened. And I knew actually, before. That, that idea, yeah. Actually, the idea of uh, other people wanting to hear more of about it after it would be fulfilled uh, i wasn't too excited about the idea myself <laughs> me neither um <laughs> one is i i didn't think i was prepared for something like that um exactly. but, also, but, but i also thought you know we could be under great attack and you know so so we had this idea of be this wonderful thing that's what many people thought um i think it would have been worse for us so, than for, happened than it is now what for, for some reason, the naive me, never, that never even entered into my mind. I had no concern for the backlash. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I wasn't, not, I wasn't concerned for the backlash. I was concerned for, am I able to stand in that time? Well, that, that, that as well. That, yeah. that, that yeah. definitely was true for me. Yeah. That was the, the real issue for me because I thought, no, no way. Like, you know, no. to be put on in, to be put in the public um you know arena the definitely definitely i'm not skilled enough i don't i don't have the ability to do what would need to be done um or the so humility i would add we we don't have the humility of say moses or noah or isaiah the experience of isaiah being finding himself naked before god's glory yeah that, that, that's yeah, the experience well, we all must have. So well, the thing is, faith, the faith too. I mean, when I look at my life, I mean, obviously, um, I would not be ready for that. And and you know, and I thought about it, and I said, you know, we don't we we don't have anything really to offer. I mean, we don't. We're we're not we're not the people that God's going to use in in doing that work. That something had to happen. Um. If we were going to yeah, be okay, something, Let, let's take that something. And uh, the thing I saw lacking in myself was, though I see even clearer now, is humility. Uh, the 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 places that I see pride in my past, from this point in my life and timeline wise, are amazing. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm I, I just who am I? Who was I? That mm -hmm. was that wasn't good. That wasn't nice, or and it wasn't within me to even see it at the time. I I was fine. Yeah. So all those things, pride, face to face, definitely bring it face to face with our face to face with our uh, what do you call it shortcomings? Yeah, self confidence. You know, it, when when really we don't deserve to even have self confidence because we're nothing. But but those are the things that we have to go through. And, and so the symbolic use of numbers is given by God. And as we're going to go through these studies, we will see more and more that, that this is all God's hand, that this wasn't something contrived by some intellect, um, whether human or satanic, it's something that comes from God alone. Um, so thanks. We're going to close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study. And we ask for your continued blessing upon this Sabbath. And we just ask for your comfort as we uh, go through 
our day-to-day -day lives. And we pray for the study tomorrow morning and the things that you're continually teaching us. And we pray that your angels can watch over each one of us, our loved ones, and the people in this movement and those around us. And may the Holy Spirit speak to their hearts. Forgive us for our sins and help us to continue to learn of you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.